In this video, I will show you a case study of a pin connection you can see here. We'll analyze it with nonlinear FEA uh, and also we'll compare the outcomes with code procedures. Uh, this is how the initial geometry looks like. I will change it a bit later on, you will see why. Uh, and also uh, on the animations, I will always show you either for von Mises stress distribution, as you can see here, or plastic strain distribution. Those look distinctly different, so I think it will be easier to uh, recognize which one is which one. Uh, but as you analyze anything with FEA or you design it in mm, according to the code, it's always important to understand what are the possible failure modes you will face in the design. I think that the one easiest to imagine would be the failure of a pin uh, due to shear. Uh, you can uh, see it here. Also, the one that is very commonly seen would be a, a contact failure of the plate. In other words, the pin is strong enough, but it pushes so strongly ag against the opening that, that the plate yields due to this contact pressure and simply fails. Um, a bit less obvious uh, failure would be plate in shear. Uh, if you would have not enough steel around the pin connection, instead of failing into contact, uh, you could actually rip a piece of the plate away from the, uh, from the plate, and this is, of course, a failure as well. So let's analyze those cases one by one. Firstly, uh, failure of the pin in shear. Uh, in FEA, it looks quite of nice. Um, in the moment of failure, if you look closely at the plastic strain distribution, this is what you would get. However, uh, it's easier to understand how the failure looks like if you increase the deformation on the pin, as you can see on the left, and the animations are uh, on the right. Uh, please note how small amount of plastic strain build up, how fast this goes. This is because uh, when you have a pin, it firstly accumulates certain stress, and then as it starts to fail in those planes here, uh, it actually goes very quickly because it's almost entire area in one go. So it's like nothing, 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 everything, and it fails. Uh, and this is why it goes, uh, goes so quickly. Uh, as you can see here, uh, this is the equilibrium path. So on the horizontal line, there is a displacement uh, shown in the connection and on vertical line, the applied force. The force is for the total connection. This means that, as you can see on the chart, the capacity is uh, around 2,900 kilonewtons. But this is a capacity of entire connection. Our connection, in this case, has two shear planes. Simply put, we have to shear our pin in two places to cause failure. This means that a single shear plane of the pin uh, has half of the capacity of our model. Of course, the connection has the total capacity. However, if we want to compare to the code procedure, and I will be using Eurocode here, the code procedure gives us an equation to calculate a single shear capacity. So I'm calculating it here just so we can compare it with the code outcomes. Actually, the procedure to calculate the uh, capacity uh, due to shear of the pin is very straightforward, as you can see here. You can note that I omitted all the safety factors. Of course, those will be involved, but since we just want to compare outcomes whether I apply the safety factor or not, uh, it's kind of irrelevant because the relation between the outcomes will be the same. So I'm, I'm not going uh, there not to complicate things. And as you can see, the outcome obtained in FEA and the outcome obtained according to the code procedures are almost identical. So there is a very, uh, very nice alignment here. The second possible failure uh, is failure of the plate due to contact. Uh, this is how it looks. And before we go any further, I have to admit that I've changed something in the model that you wouldn't recognize easily. And that is, I 
increased the yield strength of the pin. In the first analysis, it's the pin that failed. And there is nothing I can rerun in the analysis to obtain the different failure mode. I had to change the model somehow because the weakest thing will fail. So I simply make the pin stronger. So I assure in some sense that it's the plate that will fail. And this is why you can see a different stress distribution in the model now. And this is how the failure looks like when we look at von Mises stress and plastic strains. While those animations definitely look great, this is not an outcome because it doesn't tell us uh, what the capacity is. The outcome would be the same chart we plotted previously, but now it looks differently because it's a different case. Uh, you can see uh, that this chart has a clear maximum so the capacity of our model is a bit higher than uh, 2,100 kilonewtons. In previous case, we had a pin that has two shear planes. Here, we, our model has two plates that fail into contact. So capacity of a single plate is, of course, half of the capacity of the model. And again, I'm calculating this so we can compare this outcome to the code value. And as you can see again, the Eurocode procedure to calculate uh, the capacity is very, very simple. And again, the, this agrees with FEA outcome very, very accurately. So, so far it was pretty simple. Now it will get a bit more complicated. Let's talk about plate failure in shear. First of all, I have to fix my model. Since it was done according to the code, the geometry was such that it assured that the plate will fail in contact. That was the goal, essentially. But now, since I want to obtain a different failure mode, I have to change something. And this something is the amount of steel that I will have around my pin. I had 120 millimeters in the beginning, I am reducing this amount simply to change the failure mode of the system. And as I've made those changes and analyzed the model again, you can see that now plastic strains distribute differently. When we look at the failure animation of the connection, you might be able to spot a difference in how this behaves. I will get to that in a bit more detail later. Uh, of course, again, we will plot the equilibrium path. And you can note that the capacities uh, of the model is around 1,460 kilonewtons. Before we decide uh, what would be the single um, value we want to compare, uh, let's firstly take a look at how the plates are really failing. If I would show you only the von Mises stress distribution here, uh, you might be actually hard pressed to note what's the actual failure mode. However, if we plot plastic strains, it becomes way easier because you can distinctly see that each plate has two shear planes where the plastic strains align and this is the, where the plate fails. So uh, there is no code procedure to calculate that. Uh, this is because the code simply mm, asks you to say, okay, uh, you want to have your plate with such a geometry to make sure that the shear failure of the plate will never happen. And there are requirements. Of course, our connection do not fulfill the requirements uh, of the code simply because we have too little steel. Those 70 millimeters, it's not enough according to the code. So we would simply be outside of what is quote unquote allowed. But let's say that for whatever reason, you have to design it this way. You're aware that it will reduce the capacity. You understand that this is not really following the code guidelines, but the situation on site or in whatever you're trying to do is such that you really need to do it. In such a case, Eurocode for connections will not give you an equation to calculate the capacity of this plate. So what could you do? Well, understanding that there will be a shear failure, which is important to understand, by the way, 
uh, you could say, okay, I have two shear planes, those will be 70 millimeter deep each, because that's the thickness of the plate, right? That would be a conservative assumption. Optimistically, you could say, yeah, but my pin has a certain width. And as it pushes through the plate, it's not through the 70 millimeters, it's instead through 109 millimeters, as I marked here. So that would be an optimistic assumption. And suddenly, we can't really calculate the exact capacity, but we've got a lower and upper bound that we can calculate. So let's do that. And you can see the upper bound on the top, the lower bound on the bottom. Of course, the calculation of the uh, shear plane capacity is relatively simple. And now let's get back to the nonlinear FEA outcomes. This is where we left off. And now I can tell you, okay, we have two plates. Each plate has two shear planes. This means that in our model, there are a total of four shear planes that will be failing. This is the capacity of the model. Capacity of a single shear plane is around 360 kilonewtons. So when we compare, you can see that the value obtained from nonlinear FEA is within the, the bounds of what we've calculated. So the lower bound was a bit less than 300 kilonewtons. The upper bound is over 400 kilonewtons and we got uh, 360. So it's within the boundaries of what we think is reasonable. However, the huge benefit is that we got a precise value. We don't have to operate with lower and upper bound, especially since there is a huge difference in value between the upper and, uh, upper and lower bound. It's not very accurate engineering in this case because we simply do not know how the shear plane will form in a plate. And this is where nonlinear FEA really shines. So let's look at a few conclusions we can draw from this. Firstly, nonlinear FEA is extremely accurate. Notice that when we calculated pin failure in shear and plate failure in contact, the difference in outcomes obtained from nonlinear FEA and the code procedure were, was basically negligible. So the nonlinear FEA allowed us to compute the capacity extremely precisely. However, the biggest benefit is that it allowed us to calculate the capacity precisely even if the code procedure is not present. So here, it's not really, the outcome is um, not really code procedure, it's more or less like calculated according to the strength of materials based on the assumption that we will either conservatively assume the, the depth of the shear plane or will optimistically assume it. But of course, if you would be designing this, you wouldn't be sure where exactly you are. And nonlinear FEA provides you with a clear, distinct answer you can be certain of. But also, uh, nonlinear FEA allows you to predict a failure mode. Imagine that you always design pin connections according to Eurocode. This means that you always follow the geometrical guidelines, and as such, you never encounter a shear failure of the plate, simply because the geometry was such that the plates were always uh, failing due to contact. If that is the case, you may not know that such a failure exists. If you would calculate uh, the connection by hand, you would either have to pessimistically and optimistically guess the shear depth, but that even assumes that you are aware that this failure can happen. On the other hand, when you're doing the connection in nonlinear FEA, you don't really have to know, although it's very recommended that you always do, but if, like, let's say that it's a surprise to you, nonlinear FEA would still predict this failure mode for you, regardless if you're aware of it or not. Uh, of course, when you look at von Mises um, distribution in uh, plate failing due to contact and plate failing due to shear, it may not be extremely obvious where is the difference, but if you look at plastic strain distribution, it's very easy to note that plate in contact on the left has plastic strains around the pin where the plate is failing, and uh, failure in shear forms two distinctive shear planes through the plate, showing you a different failure mode that, if 
it would happen would have a lower capacity, so it would be governing the design. And as such, nonlinear FEA can really help you predicting what is the actual failure mode of your system. So what is worth remembering? First of all, when you're doing a design of something simple and you have good code procedures that cover this particular case, definitely follow the code. I'm not here to tell you to calculate everything with nonlinear FEA. That would be insane waste of effort. Uh, after all, you can imagine that in plate in shear or plates in contact, the a correlation between a simple equation and a very complex nonlinear FEA model was perfect. So the code equation requires way less effort. And that's a very good thing to understand that you don't need to follow uh, the nonlinear FEA route in design every time. However, as you will design things in your career, you will quickly notice, especially if you read the codes carefully, that very often you will be outside of code procedures. Of course, codes provide the equations. You can always put numbers into those equations, right? But if you read the code and see what is required of your model, what assumptions were made and what other things your structure has to fulfill in order to be applicable, for this particular um, design route, you will quickly notice that very often you will be outside of code procedures. And in those cases, nonlinear FEA can be extremely accurate and really help you to design things you would be hard pressed to design otherwise. Sure, you could use lower and upper bounds as we did as we did here. But the problem is that if you want to optimize something, uh, using lower and upper bound isn't really the approach that allows you uh, to be uh, very, very precise. Also, FEA will find a failure mode of your model for you. So if you're designing something and you've set up the model properly, even if you were unaware that something can fail because you missed it or you simply didn't know that such a failure mode exists, a properly set nonlinear problem will actually fa find this failure mode for you. So it's like a fail safe in case you missed something, which is very, very good. And in the end, nonlinear FEA is just awesome. I really enjoy it and I enjoy the raw power nonlinear FEA gives me over a very complex problems, I honestly can tell you I wouldn't be able to solve otherwise. So it's a very powerful tool. If you want to learn nonlinear FEA, you can sign up for my FEA wizard newsletter and start learning today. Every Tuesday, you'll get an email to your inbox packed full with useful FEA knowledge. So I really hope that you will subscribe and that we'll stay in touch. Have a lovely day and see you around.